we have Jesus encountering two people. A rich young ruler and our beloved Peter who uh, can get his foot in his mouth at times. And we can do that at times. Um, I think this is a fantastic word for all of us this morning. It's something that we can take for granted at times because we do live in a city where we can gather like this and you can hear the Gospel. You could hear it for eight hours this morning if you had the time, if you had the desire, if I had the energy. (laughs) Uh, I will be preaching this evening at Kirk, so that will not be the case today. But it's very easy to take for granted what we're going to hear today, but I would warn you this morning, my brothers and sisters, when we take this for granted, we are on the verge of having an identity crisis. And that is not a good thing. Now I understand if you watch enough television, you always have an identity crisis, but the good news, right, is that there's something that they'll sell you, and that will take care of that. Well, that's not what I'm talking about this morning. You see, you have been called from darkness to light, from hopelessness to hope. For some of you, you have been called from uh, a situation where your family is very tightly embracing you to a situation where your family thinks that you have lost your mind because you hold to the Gospel. We're going to address these issues this morning. The Scripture is very clear. Chapter 18, starting at verse 18 in Luke's Gospel. A ruler questioned Jesus, saying, Good teacher, What shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. The ruler said, All these things I have kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, One thing you still lack. Sell all that you possess and distribute to the poor and you shall have treasure in heaven and come follow me. You can imagine the ruler, right? He's kind of on the edge of his seat waiting for Jesus to tell him the one last thing he needs to do and he's probably filled with happiness and anticipation. It's probably something that Jesus didn't realize he's already covered and so he's about ready to cross the finish line and then Jesus blurts that out. Can you imagine? Well, we are told of the response. And when the ruler had heard these things, he became very sad. Why did he become very sad? Because he was extremely rich. And Jesus looked at him and said, How hard is it for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God? For it is easy for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now notice the response of those who are around in verse 26. They who heard it said, Then who can be saved? Now why would they say that? A little bit of history is important at this point before we go any further. You see, under the Old Covenant, there was a phrase that the prophets, the minor prophets, and the major prophets would declare, and it was this, that you could dwell under your fig and vine. That spoke of a physical and material prosperity, whereby God had eliminated Israel, His little flock, from all of their enemies in order that they could put down their sword, in order that they did not have to look over their shoulder, and they could rest under, did it say the king's fig and vine? Did it say their neighbor's fig and vine? No, your fig and vine. And so it was thought, and rightfully so, that the picture that was was being portrayed is that their physical prosperity was the continuity, right? A picture of their spiritual prosperity. And it came to a point that the Lord continued to prosper them in spite of their rebellion. And then the prophets began to say, now hold on a second. Just because you have prosperity doesn't necessarily mean that you're in rebellion. It may be true that you are honoring God, but you be warned. You be warned. Because some of you are living under your fig and vine, but you're in rebellion. You're going to witchcraft. You're going to idolatry. I've told you not to do these things. Do not be fooled by the prosperity around you. For I'm going to come and I'm going to judge the house of Israel and the house of Judah. So that explains in part why people are surprised because they thought to themselves, right? The picture of this financial prosperity must mean that this rich young ruler has it all together. If this guy can't make it in, 
How can I? Is there any hope? Well, for you who are familiar with the kingdom of heaven expanding into time and space, everything is turned upside down, correct? And so when Jesus says, blessed are the poor, people, what do you mean blessed are the poor? If you can't give birth to a child, if you're poor, if your donkey runs off, clearly you are under the chastening of the Lord. It's the rich man who's in good shape. Clearly he will not dwell in Sheol. So now we see where do we go from here? Where do we go from here? Those who heard it said, then who can be saved? But Jesus said the things that are impossible with people are possible with God. Now here's Peter. Here's our second encounter in our narrative this morning. Peter said, Jesus, behold, we have left our homes and followed you. Now, we're going to look at that word behold here later on, but let's keep going. And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, truly I say to you, notice the intimacy that he speaks with Peter, there is no one, and that includes everybody here at Cliffwood, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times as much at this time and in the age to come eternal life. There's some promises that are pregnant in the text if you noticed. Verse 31, Then he took the twelve aside and said to him, them, Behold, notice what Peter said, Jesus, behold. Right? We've done this. Now it's Jesus' turn to say behold. Right? Behold. We are going up to Jerusalem, and all things which are written through the prophets about the Son of Man will be accomplished. For he will be handed over to the Gentiles, and will be mocked and mistreated and spit upon. And after they have scourged him, they will kill him, and the third day he will rise again. Again, could you imagine the response of the audience? The first response from the rich young ruler is he's devastated. The second response from Peter and the disciples is they're just completely confounded. This is entirely unusual to them. Where is any hope to be found in what Jesus has just declared to his disciples? My brothers and sisters, we're going to look at some promises from God's Word in this passage, and it's going to encourage us this morning. For my sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. I am the bread of life, says Jesus and so we are going to understand that there will be some promises that we see in this passage. Promises in the past, promises for today, and promises for the future. That shall warm our hearts this morning, I believe. It certainly has borne warming mine. However, look at the disciples, verse 34. But the disciples understood none of these things, and the meaning of this statement was hidden from them, and they did not comprehend the things that were said. Behold, this is God's Word. Would you bow with me once more as I pray? Heavenly Father, I ask that You would illuminate Your Word. And Lord, that You would encourage us and bless us. Lord, we thank You that You have given us Your Word. Cause us not to take it for granted. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, where do we go from here? It seems to me that two of our candidates are experiencing a difficult day. They are getting responses that are not giving them that hope that they want immediately. My question for you this morning is, anybody here ever had a bad day because you decided to follow Jesus? Now, of course, we understand that that decision is one that's wrought by the work of the Spirit, but you understand where I'm going with this. This is the decision that Peter made. And he gets this unusual response, and he doesn't know what to do with it. And so I'd ask you, and if some of you had a difficult day or perhaps a difficult week, some of you have put a smile on your face this morning, but if I were to look in your interior, you were limping in. Have you been there? What do you do on those days where you've given your all, when you've done what God has asked you to do, but life still doesn't seem to make sense? What do you do when you're like Peter? By the way, that word behold, it means I need your attention, please. Right? Remember, this is man talking to God. What, what do you do? Where do we go with this? This chapter reveals a microcosm of the entire narrative that we find in God's Word. Man encountering God. And many want to meet and commit 
to Jesus. He's very attractive. You can run to all sorts of New Age bodegos. You can run into all sorts of of, uh, conferences where people claim to be liberals or atheists, and you name the name of Jesus. And initially, they say, oh, I've heard about Jesus. He's the guy who loves everybody and heals everybody. And and, uh, that mean God in the Old Testament, we don't need him. And this guy, Paul, he was crazy. He's a... He's a narcissist and he's a hater. And you'll run into this, right? People in in the initially encounter Jesus and he's attractive. And even we, as we encounter Jesus, when we hear the gospel, there's a period where everything seems pristine. So it was the rich, rich young ruler. He's excited to meet Jesus. And here's Peter. He's saying, Lord, we have followed you this whole way. Now behold, we've left all. Now what? And this can happen in our lives. I say it again. We hear the Gospel. The Holy Spirit works in us. We, the elect, rejoice. And there's a period in our lives where everything seems pristine. It can be over the course of several years. And we can enjoy a season of comfort. And everything seems to shout that God is close to us. Now, your elder mentioned that uh, part of my territory is Augusta. I work for Yancey Brothers on the power division. Every hospital, uh, military base, water treatment plant needs a form of redundancy so that when utility goes out, you still have clean drinking water, that the military can still protect you, and an ambulance can come to your aid. There's a generator somewhere that you can see or maybe you can't see. Now I see them everywhere. They're in my dreams. But this is my territory. And I, I submit to you this morning that sometimes our walk with God can be like this. I, I used to dread coming to Augusta on a business level. Bear with me. You may not know this. You take it for granted. You guys are a tough town. You guys are tough. That's a compliment. You guys kind of band together. You like to do things in-house. I, I think if, if all of Georgia were to, to, to dissipate, I think Augusta would, would be standing strong. Just bear with me. It is not easy to, to crack the, the nut to do business in this town. You guys are very self-sufficient. You like to do things on your own. I'm not disrespecting you. There was a time when I did not like driving to here because I, my company said, Blake, we need you to get business in Augusta. And I thought, oh my goodness. They don't need me. I'm that carpetbagger from Savannah. And I speak Canadian. But then there was this day when everything seemed to fall into place. There was a radio station that... Um, needed a renewal on their service contract. And incidentally, I had lunch with him. I discovered that he didn't believe in the gospel. I got to share the gospel with him over lunch. And then he said, you know, I have these other units. Let's go for a little drive out in the country. And we're driving, and and it's right where uh, North Augusta and, and Augusta proper meet. And there's these beautiful rolling hills, and the sun is shining, and the trees are singing, and the bees are singing, and the birds are singing. And I kid you not, there was a sign on the side of the road with a Bible verse from Isaiah talking about God's promises for his people. So here I am rolling down the road, just finished you know, sharing the gospel. I'm going to get to survey out in the country these uh, tower sites and bring more business in, and, which is a miracle in of itself because Augusta's such a tough town. That's how I like my Christianity. And everything's just falling into place. And there's literally Bible verses on the side of the road. Right? You're literally driving down the road. Presto. But what about when the honeymoon is over? We've all heard that uh, rhetoric, right? Highlighting the reality of marriage when the initial phase of romance and the seeming perfect feelings reign, expectations are met. The rainy days seem like bliss. This is the honeymoon phase. This is the baby phase, excuse me, of the Christian walk. And for some, it can go on for years. For some, it lasts only a week. And this is when the vows of have and hold and health and wealth and better and richer are in full effect. And the notion of of you taking up your cross for Jesus, this just seems perfect. But then the other shoe drops. You see, Christ has called us to suffering, right? We just heard what Job went through. We heard what Paul said to his critics in the New Testament passage that was read by our elder, he was dealing with brethren who were not too kind to him. We're called to suffer. And then the other side kicks in. Sickness, worse, poor, nitpicking, monotony, unmet expectations, neglect, trials. The honeymoon is over. That first fight between best friends, that career that was supposed to 
plant an office in New York, now takes a nosedive, fill in the blank. And that's why people go and they seek marriage counseling, right? Well, obviously I'm building an analogy here because when reality wakes up and romance sleeps, love is costly and words are cheap. So Jesus is going to give us, His bride, some comfort and some counsel on those days when it's just tough getting up in the morning. So let's go back to the encounter. Notice this. Some receive the Gospel with great joy. The rich young ruler, he comes bouncing along. He's got everything lined up. Jesus is going to give him the final word. He's going to inherit eternal life. But then the expectations, the trials, the cares of this world, the miseries of this life, they rear their ugly head. And we would hate to admit it, but the glory of Christ feels or seems not so attractively glorious. And this is all under the obligation of Christian perseverance. So we're going to address that. Because it can be, seem uncertain and painful, and we can be like Peter. Lord, I've done what You want me to do. Now what? Life seems uncertain. Jesus, are You there? And it's in the midst of these seasons that the devil and our flesh now become issues. And the devil our greatest foe in our flesh, that is, our sinful nature, would strive to convince us of one of two deceptions. That, first of all, a loving, reasonable God would never ask us to give up anything. When really we understand that Christianity requires all. And this was the outcome of the rich young ruler, right? He encounters Jesus and he can't believe that Jesus would expect anything from him. After all, is that reasonable? And the second deception, and this is what Peter eventually will fall into, and I would say that we fall into this category, is that sometimes it feels like God would never give us anything. We're just kind of hanging out there, suffering and waiting for things to get better or the strength to worship Him as we ought. And we can feel condemned. His presence feels too far away. Our faith feels too weak. And Satan would say it's all lies. And in the midst of the fear and the uncertainty, eventually Peter, yes, the one who's boasting, Lord, I've given you all, will end up denying Jesus. One time? You know the Scriptures. Three times. So what do we do when the honeymoon is over? Now, listen. Peter existed in the same reality that you and I do. I remember when I was up for um, ordination and, and the, the, the committee, um, and I think... Our Mr. Schreiber was part of that. They said, Blake, we all put uh, our pants on one leg at a time and um, study and, 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 and we've got your back and, and we're happy that you're here. Same thing, Peter. He's just like you and I. He's not some super saint. He puts his pant leg on one at a time. In fact, as I already declared, he ends up denying Jesus. But my point is this. He lives in the same reality that you and I do. The promises that we will be encouraged from the Gospel this morning are for you today. Not just some people who walked around years ago. Now listen to what Peter says. He says, Behold, we have left our homes and followed you. That word, behold, I said that already. It's very significant. In other words, Jesus, I need your attention, please. Now, I'm not going to read into Peter's uh, disposition. It may have been an, an attitude of optimism or fear. But regardless, it'd be safe to say that Peter in his statement is conveying an obvious question which we've already discussed already. That is this. Jesus, now what? And Jesus recognizes this. And Jesus anticipates that there would be times when the honeymoon is over. Then He responds to Peter and all who have confessed and followed Jesus by revealing some wonderful, breathtaking promises. First of all, in 29 and 30. Jesus, I need your attention, please. We've left all our homes and followed you. What does Jesus say? Does Jesus declare, Peter, no, no, you need to do more. You need to sing louder. You need to praise God more. Peter, why are you even questioning me? Just keep doing what you're doing. Keep your nose to the grindstone. Don't feel sorry for yourself. Get more involved in your church. Count your blessings. And once you get your eyes off yourself, then you'll feel better. Is that what the passage says? I fear that sometimes we say that to each other. We mean well. No. This is what Jesus says. My brothers and sisters, there may come a time in your life when everything seems perfect in time and space, but nevertheless, you're going to hit that wall. That now what, Jesus? 
In fact, if this is about those who have everything together, then it was the rich young ruler who ought to be up here preaching to us this morning. No. When that sudden crisis of faith hits you and it will, the answer, did you notice Jesus' response? It's not doing more for Jesus. Now, there's a time and a place where our works glorify God. I'm not dismissing that. I'm not talking about an easy Christianity here. I'm not talking about this, this idea that we no longer have to take up the cross because Jesus did it for us once and for all. No. But the answer at this point, this crisis of faith, is not doing more. It's not about having it all together. This is an issue of identity, my brothers and sisters. Yes, there's a time and place to count your blessings and to deny deny self-pity and to stop trying to find your inner victim status. But generally, the comfort we need is to understand our own inability, this is what Peter needed to know, and focus entirely upon the love and compassion of Jesus Christ. That's it. And it seems obscure, right? When, you're, when your feelings are turned up and, and, and you've read that passage of Scripture six times and you've memorized the Westminster Confession and you've gone to all the prayer meetings and you're at church all the time and you would feel ashamed to admit that you're in a crisis of faith. My brothers and sisters, get your eyes on Jesus. Get your eyes on Jesus. Cling to Jesus and His promises. I recently had been reading John Murray. There's this book that he wrote, um, Redemption Applied and Accomplished. I wish someone would have given me that book when I first became a believer. There's a chapter, chapter 10, where, uh, and I'm going to paraphrase our, our brother Murray. He says this, In the midst of our crisis of faith, we cling to Jesus and His promises. And then he says this, He says his promises are not placing faith in his plan. His promises are placing your faith in him. We declare the gospel, we place our faith in him. Do you see the distinction there? If you only place your faith in the gospel message, you will forever wonder if you're actually in the gospel. If you actually have assurance. But when, says Murray, we place our eyes on Jesus, We have all the assurance and comfort that we need. This is where Jesus will point us in the answer that he gives to Peter. Excuse me. Faith in him, the word which became flesh and dwelt among us. And so easily we can get in the habit of placing faith in hoping we are saved and loved rather than placing our gaze upon the living Christ. And notice how Jesus speaks to us. He says, truly, I say to you, individuals, the one that he loved, you formed in your mother's womb, who he saw. It's very personal. It has everything to do with our identity and our emotional maturity. You see, when our Lord uses that disclaimer, our ears ought to perk up. Truly, I say to you, yes, the devil and our flesh and the world will try to deceive us, but regardless of what anyone else says to us, regardless of our circumstances, regardless of how we feel, Jesus is telling the truth of the matter. And we can be secure in that. Amen? The truth of the matter. Jesus says this, Peter, don't be deceived. The devil in the flesh would tempt you not to trust in God's promises. And here's the first promise. And the promise that he leaves Peter is for us in the present. Notice what he says. Peter, I promise I will take care of you. Now, what does that mean? Let's look at that verse again. Truly I say to you that no one has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God. Now obviously Jesus isn't encouraging um, dissolution of marriages and child neglect. But what does it mean when he says receive many times as much of what? And it seems puzzling, but it's all clarified when we look at the motive. What is the motive that Jesus declares? For the sake of of the kingdom. And so there's husbands and wives and sons and daughters and aunts and uncles who are forced to leave their homes in countries all over the world for the sake of Jesus' kingdom. There's others who leave friends and families in obedience to the call to foreign mission fields. But my brothers and sisters, I'd say to you this morning, even in your familiar relationships, you are called. What does that look like? Even if you're not facing eviction because of your faith in Christ. 
Or perhaps you're not called to the foreign mission field. You're still called. And this means to forsake your family members or friends when it comes to the crossroads of choosing righteousness in the spheres of influence in our life. Let me give you an example. The next time, I have a nine-year-old daughter. Y'all have asked me about her. She's doing great. She wishes she was here this morning. And the older she gets, the more beautiful my little girl's eyes have these, these words that say, Daddy, I would never lie. Daddy, give me whatever I want all the time. And I'm always tempted to, yeah, I mean, come on, she's nine and she's so cute and what's my little girl's eyes? No! What is my role? I have to forsake my daughter. I can't give in to her manipulation. In other words, the next time you deny your child his or her desire to manipulate you into giving into their sinful demands, which might harm or neglect their Christian testimony or your Christian testimony, and you've left their ungodly plot for the sake of giving glory to the kingdom of God, you've forsaken all. Now some of you are going, well, pff, yeah, of course. And I would say, okay, have you looked at the world around you? I mean, we live in a world where, I mean, you're, you're Mugabe and Hitler if you even raise your voice at your child. But we know the Scripture says if you refuse to discipline your child, and the Hebrew actually means you hate them. Right? You spare the rod, you spoil the child. In the Hebrew, it means hate. You forsake the cunning, nine-year-old, beautiful eyes. And you say, honey, no. For the sake of your soul, for the sake of this household, for the sake of denying, no, you cannot have your way. Or how about this? The next time you refuse to join in with vanity and gossip and materialism with your sister or your cousin or your mother or your father, and it seems tempting to leave the mentality for the sake of the kingdom, God is pleased. You may look like the outsider. You may look like the nerd. You may look like the killjoy. Not so, says Christ. You have forsaken all, right? Living contrary to the world in which the flesh and blood would yearn for, yet you forsake. It can be lonely. And God needs, knows you need community. And so here is the promise. We've forsaken all. What is God's promise? God promises the provisions that will be more than enough, not a pie in the sky, but here. Now the question is, what does that look like? Now, the obvious answer, in many cases, God will use what? Some of you have experienced rejection from your family, even perhaps by the denomination that you've chosen. I experienced that. What is Jesus saying? You have the body of Christ, and what do they do? They come around. And that person who you never even knew their name now becomes your mother. And that young man over there who who you introduced yourself to one Sunday now becomes your son. And now you become a source of encouragement. But there's more than that. And some of you are looking at me puzzled because you're thinking like John Calvin thought. You're wondering, where are you going with this? Well, John Calvin said, now wait a minute. If we preach this text only saying that when we forsake our, our, our mother and our father and we go to the foreign mission field or whatever is the case, and the body of Christ comes around us. John Calvin and anybody here who's been in a prison cell for most of their life for believing the Gospel says, well, wait a minute, I didn't have anybody come visit me in prison because no one was allowed to visit me. Where do we go from here? In fact, Calvin had, had some questions here. He says this, he says, Jesus' promises about rewarding His followers many times as much in this life might contradict what many experience. For in the greater number of cases, those who've been deprived by their parents or children or other relatives, who've been reduced to widowhood and stripped of their wealth, thrown in jail for the testimony of Christ, are so far from recovering their property, their sanity, but actually experience human exile, loneliness, and rejection and poverty. So is Jesus just talking about the family of God? Listen to me, please. Helping us? Is that his means of comfort? Now, how could Calvin say that? Well, if you know anything about Calvin's ministry, did you know that he was in exile his entire ministry as a refugee? Rome was after him night and day. He feared for his life. He's not being cynical. He's not being a skeptic. He's talking about himself. His entire pastoral ministry was his exile, his refuge. At times, Geneva loved him. The next minute, they hated him, and they're throwing stones at him literally 
The next minute, they're, they're, they're inviting him back. He was constantly ill. He lived under death threats and persecution. His parents were upset for him for signing up to be a pastor instead of going to law school. Yet he believed the words that Jesus spoke to Peter that he would have comfort now. Even though God might use us, the body of Christ, in different avenues, I think Calvin gets it. I think all of us can be encouraged by this. Calvin came to this conclusion. If any man estimates the value and comfort of the immediate grace of God by which he relieves the sorrows of his people, he or she will acknowledge that it is better than all the parties and the family reunions and inheritance and riches of the world. Because even though God permit his people to be severely afflicted, he never abandons them. My brother and sister, though you may not understand what is going on in spite of the fact that you've given your all to Jesus, he will never abandon you. Praise God, he brings people around us to comfort us. But what about those times when you're in the car all alone? And what about the widow who's in their bed all alone? And what about this person who's gone through that? Or what about the time when you're at work and you're standing up for Jesus and everybody is talking about you and you're all alone? We're not here having a pep rally, right? Calvin says, no, that's not the point. Yes, praise God when the people of God come around and comfort this. But Calvin maintained, as do I, and we can be encouraged by this. My brothers and sisters, his comfort is immediate now. Because God will permit his people to be severely afflicted. He never abandons them. And those who shall willingly lose all for the sake of Christ will be more happy even in this life, says Calvin, than if they had retained the full possession of everything they had lost. God will use the family of God, yes. But my brothers and sisters, sometimes no man knows another man's sorrow. And nothing compares to the family member who sticks closer than a brother. Jesus. Jesus Christ, who encourages us through the love and comfort of the Holy Spirit, which proceeds from God the Father and Jesus Christ. But notice the next promise we have from our Lord. I give you comfort now, but I will give you comfort, what? In eternal life. Eternal life with Jesus, with the family of God. Enjoying a new heaven and a new earth. That Lamb which became the perfect sacrifice and rose from the dead and defeated sin, hell, and death is able now to give us the gift of eternal life. Perfect. Neither shall it be cursed because of the fall of Adam and Eve. And there'll be no more death. And the devil will no more afflict us. And Jesus will wipe away every tear from our eye. My brothers and sisters, when life says to you now what? Are you clinging to Jesus? I think sometimes when we're going through, through these difficulties, we would like Jesus to perform a miracle, right? Like pull some coins out of a fish's mouth. Or... or you know, multiply the bread. You know, Lord, give me something to sink my teeth into. Right? You can just see Peter. Now what, Jesus? He's going to give us exactly what we need. Amen? Immediate comfort. I will comfort you now in this life. This isn't a pie-in-the-sky religion. And that second promise, Peter, I'm going to give you eternal life. I'm going to give it to you. You're not going to earn it like that presumptuous, rich, young ruler who just ran away, who loved his money, and that gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ was accomplished by the final promise which Jesus will now declare to His disciples then and now. And notice that Jesus uses that same word that Peter used. Verse 28. Behold. Verse 31. Peter, I need your attention, please. Peter, I need your attention. I promise you, disciples, who have forsaken all for the kingdom of God, Cliffwood, lonely soul, discouraged soul, disillusioned soul here this morning, I promise you my comfort. I promise you eternal life. I promise to give my very life, my blood for you. That is our hope. Though the world may laugh. And it's very graphic. Did you notice that this third promise? Behold, I need your attention, please. I'll give you my life and my death 
and resurrection. It's very graphic and puzzling for our human understanding of what we would consider a sovereign and mighty plan of rescue and security. So contrary to what the world considers a superstar, I love reading uh, military history um, from the Vietnam War era to World War II, even up into the, the um, campaigns that are taking place in Afghanistan and Iraq. I came across this and I was amazed by the contrast compared to our Savior. You know, oftentimes when we think of sovereignty, right, especially as Presbyterians, we think of power and control, and that is most certainly uh, some of the attributes of sovereignty. But think about the sovereignty that we are given in this passage. A broken human being murdered. Now look what the world considers the hero. The year was 1996. Cheers swept through the throng in the courtyard as the tall, well-built man with a long black beard stepped out on the roof of the old mosque. He held a cloak in his hands, allowing it to flutter open in the early morning breeze. With great reverence, he carefully wrapped it around his body. The audience comprised of over 1,000 distinguished Afghan Islamic scholars cheered in unison, proclaiming their unqualified support for him. Mullah Muhammad Omar, by the simple wearing of the cloak, purported to be the Prophet Muhammad's ancient Rome, confirmed his leadership. Correspondent Rashid remarked, it was a political masterstroke, for by cloaking himself with the Prophet's mantle, Omar has assumed the right to lead not just Afghans, but all Muslims. Shrouded in mystery and myth, Mullah Omar is the self-proclaimed final voice of authority within the loosely organized Taliban hierarchy. Right? Isn't that how you want your hero to come out of the gates? Right? Isn't that what our fresh flesh craves? The hero. Captain America. Thor. That old Greek influence of the classic heroism that has influenced our society in the West. But look at your Lord Jesus. What does it say? Let's look at His plan of rescue. Clothed in what? Bruises. Insults. Spit. Rejection. The cross. All for you. Your spit. Your sin. Your bruises. Your insults. Your rejection. All for you. In love. Not like a worldly leader. No, sovereignty of God for us must first be considered, says Victor Shepper, Jesus' vulnerability. Isn't that amazing? Right? There's the kingdom of heaven. Again, turned upside down. Sovereignty. Look at the sovereignty of our God, vulnerable. As Jesus calls Peter and us to be vulnerable and forsake all for the kingdom of God because He forsook all for the kingdom, even shedding His blood. Comfort today. Eternal life. His very blood for you. You see, beloved, when Jesus states earlier that all things were written through the prophets, about the Son of Man to be accomplished. My brothers and sisters, hear this again for the first time. He's referring to the promises of salvation to the Jews and to the Gentiles as prophesied by the Old Testament prophets. Jesus is pointing to the covenant of salvation fulfilled from Genesis to Revelation by the Son of Man, described by Daniel as coming with the clouds of heaven and was given dominion and glory in a kingdom that all nations should serve Him. It would be an everlasting kingdom that would never be destroyed by Satan. Never mind the mocking, the rebellion, the malice of mankind. God was not taken by surprise when Jesus was tortured and murdered and mocked. And my brothers and sisters, I'm not just simply picking on Islam, okay? Omar Amullah's plan represents the plan of the world, right? An external show of bedazzlement and aggression. But Jesus' sovereign plan for the redemption of our souls and the salvation from sin and Adam and Eve's curse wasn't a robe full of pomp and pizzazz. It was a blood-stained cross. Our God was not weak. No man took the life of Christ. He laid it down for you and for me to glorify God the Father. Is it any wonder that He is Jesus, the friend of sinners? 
And what is this result? Eternal life in His resurrection. When He single-handedly appeased the wrath of God in our place for our sin in our stead, Christ, our eternal prophet, priest, and King, defeated hell, sin, and death, that we might taste His comfort on those now what days, that we might, we might be encouraged by the eternal life, that we would be reminded that He gave His blood, all the love and comfort from Christ Himself. So the next time you have those days, my brothers and sisters, focus on His life, His death, his resurrection, what does it say in verse 34? And as I close, the disciples, they understood none of these things. You know what? The necessity of suffering by Jesus and His resurrection made no sense to them. And sometimes it doesn't make sense to us, does it? If we're honest with them, ourselves. His ways are higher than our ways. But the story didn't end there, did it? That's why you guys came to church this morning. He didn't come here to uh, hear some Yancey brother salesman from... <laughs> From Savannah, I hope not. You, you came here because your shepherd is calling you. You came here because he's given you the promise that he's going to comfort you on those days where you're wondering what's going on. That you believe that promise of eternal life. That you cling to his blood-stained hands as he offers them to you for your sin. So here's the end of it all. Keep trusting in the living God. Right? That's the answer to how long is this going to go on for. There's your answer. That's the answer that Jesus gives His disciples. There's your answer. Right? How long is this trial going to take? Why is this happening? When will it end? What is, hap what is the answer? It's the Gospel. It's the eternal life. It's His life. His resurrection. His flesh and His blood poured out for you. His mercy and grace able to carry you through the call of saying no to the world and yes, forsaking all for Him, he or she who has ears to hear, let them hear the word of the Lord. Let God be true and every man a liar. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, come soon, Lord Jesus, would you bow with me as I pray? Heavenly Father, we thank You that You have given us such comfort. That You have given us Your very life. That You have given us eternal life. And Lord Jesus, we confess at times that in the midst of the abundance that You've given us in this state, in Georgia, with, with all of the, the trappings and distractions and all of the, the wealth, all of the prosperity that You've blessed us with, there are those times when we're fearful and life seems unusual. And we're saying as Peter, Lord, behold, we've, we've done everything, now what? And Lord, so easily we can be distracted from the Gospel by the cares of this world, by the deceitfulness of riches, by trying to figure out a way out of our emotional maturity by a way of trying to figure out a, a way out of our identity crisis when, Lord, we are to set our eyes on You. So, Father, I ask in Jesus' name that You would comfort Your people right now. And on those heavy days, Lord, that they would fix their eyes upon You, the author and finisher of their faith. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.